Hello, I'm Jim Middleton and welcome to Flying by the Seat of My Paints. This is the entrepreneur podcast uh, designed for the artist who, like many of us, wants to translate their passion to a paycheck. The tips and tricks myself and upcoming guests have learned along the way are what we'd like to share to get you uh, one step closer with topics like how to promote, how to price, how to show your art, and how to become a better artist yourself. For this, our third episode, we're going to be tackling how to price your work. This is a really, really popular question with budding and even seasoned artists. Um, so we're going to explore this one pretty heavily. It's something that I've repeatedly run into myself. I run into almost every artist I speak to. Um, so I think that it deserves time. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I went back and listened to uh, our first two episodes. Thanks to everyone who's listened. I'm making notes on how to improve along the way. Uh, first episode, I added an audio track. It ran in the background. It was distracting, <laughs> I thought. Um, but I like the intro. Uh, like I said, it was good at the first, but then it played through the entire episode, which I didn't want, and that's kind of distracting. Second episode, uh, the audio was good on the pod. That's the primary, most important thing. But secondly, it uh, was louder on my recording for video. So it took, uh, I've been dealing with some computer issues getting everything squared away, but I think we finally got it where it needs to be. The other thing that I did notice is that, um, I just did it, ums and ahs. I have a <laughs> huge habit of them getting into my speech, and I have put up some notes to try to catch myself, kind of keep myself away from using them, turn myself to a pause if I need to. I found that in the first, when I was kind of spitballing a little bit through my intro, they seemed to pop up a lot. Once I get into the main topic, where I, you know, had already really understood what I wanted to talk about and where it was going, they kind of went away. So it is something I'm aware of, and maybe it's something I noticed and other people didn't, but I want the pod to be as enjoyable as you can. I want you guys to send your comments and feedbacks, thoughts. The, all those things are great, and that's all about trying to make the pod a better place, right? Something that's of value for you, because I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. So what we're going to be doing kind of going forward with these openings in the podcast, I'm going to do a What's Flying This Week segment. So we're going to start with that, um, let you know what's going on with me art-wise. If you're less interested in what I'm up to, which, hey, is absolutely fair, um, I'll put a time skip point in the pod. So if you go into the descriptions or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I'll put it in the comments. I'll put a time point where you can actually jump right to the main topic of the day. If you're less interested in what's going on in Jim's world, uh, I totally get that. You want to get to the right to the topic, we're going to let you do that. Um, but if you want to catch up, here we go. So what's flying this week? So what are some descriptive words for my last seven days? Um, overwhelmed <laughs> is the first one that pops into my head. Um, elated, definitely. Positive, trepidatious, scary, thrilling, drained. Uh, change is an amazing thing. Uh, it's a constant in life. Uh, so, I'm going to have to go back a little bit. There's like a month, you know, it's been a month of change and, and lots of stuff going on. So, uh, particularly the last couple of weeks, going back even a little bit further, we had the pandemic, which drained me horribly creatively for months. Also caused the local farmer's market, where I'd been set up uh, for almost two years. I sold there every weekend. It was, what I liked about the market is it was a set place that I had to do work. I had, well, we were open from 8 until 4 on, um, on Saturday and then from 9 until 4 on Sunday. So I had kind of a guaranteed 7-8 hour window twice a week where I sat at my table at the market with tons of art around me and painted, I live painted. So I always had, you know, 15 hours of solid paint time blocked out every week. And I lost that. I got out of the routine. And if you don't 
force the time to sit down and do the work, it can it always seems to get pushed back to the last thing you go to. So I missed having that space. I missed having people coming through to talk to me, uh, inquire about the work. That's what I liked about selling at the market too, is because I was live painting, it gave me something to do. But it also meant that I wasn't kind of a threatening sales presence for people who wanted to come up and talk. But at the same time, I wasn't like a head down in a book standoffish, right? It's kind of a, a nice balance by sitting there. So it was a, it was a blow when we lost the market. Um, the, the pandemic hit, the market closed, they got us to move all their stuff out, and then they told us that it was closed permanently. And I get it, the guy probably could make more money renting out the space, um, you know, to somebody else as opposed to, you know, a variety of ever-changing vendors who are trying out their own small business to kind of get it off the ground. But it was a very valuable space in the city and it was something that was personally valuable to me and I think was valuable to the community as well. So, um, you know, when it closed permanently, it also killed a big source of income for me. Um, then about a month ago, the company I worked for uh, had a client I was supporting cancel their contract. They canceled their contract. I got laid off. Um, I decided to try and, and take the time to focus solely on my art as long as I could. Um, I'm not going, you know, you get into kind of doubts in your head. Can I, can I do this? I mean, we all have imposter syndrome. If you're, if any artist worth their salt <laughs> probably deals with that. But, um, you've got to put the time in. And if I have time now, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm working more every day than I did ever before but you need that that income coming in so we're juggling that over the next month or so see how that works out i will look at other options if i need to i'm always going to support my family but um having both the market gone and then my steady source of income job also gone suddenly things are all kind of up in the air um at the same time living here in new brunswick canada our situation overall has been fairly good uh, when it comes to the pandemic, we flattened the curve fairly early. We've started cautiously opening back up. Part of that uh, is uh, is why I've, you know what started the whole conversation. I had a local businessman and politician uh, come to me to ask about the market and how it affected me, and you know how I felt it affected the community as a whole, and uh, you know that conversation which was two weeks ago this past Tuesday so it's about two and a half weeks ago from that led to me reaching out to other vendors I knew at the market to forming a board of directors who again are all putting in their own time we're not getting paid for this uh, to rebuild the market um, so we went from a conversation to in under two weeks, a beautiful location with around 20 vendors that had a fantastic showing. We had, I don't know if we had a thousand people through the door. We were open from eight till two, but I know we had over 500 by 11. So I'm thinking we're in the some seven, 800 range. The bar where they're, they've got a huge open room where they're letting us set up the market they uh, normally are never open in the morning for breakfast. It's kind of an evening kind of place. Uh, they're also a beer brewer. They uh, open for breakfast for the market. First time they've ever done it. Didn't expect a whole lot. They did 160 breakfasts. Awesome. So, you know, getting positive feedback from the community, getting positive feedback from the people who are willing to give us the space. And, of course, we have an election cycle coming up, so we have politicians and businessmen that are all kind of interested in COVID recovery, business development, and the market as a whole is really kind of a business incubator for, uh, you know, for 40, 50 bucks, somebody can take their wares and try it in a market where hundreds of people are going through. 
set up their table, talk to consumers as they're coming through, let them know what they have to offer, show them whatever they have local. And we wanted to really kind of set ourselves apart from the yard sale flea market crowd. So we actually named our market the Northside Creators Market. So it's very much focused on the idea of creators and growers, you know, people that, um, yeah, people that have their hands heavily involved in what they're making, growing, or, and selling, right? So um, that, that, I think, has been a good thing as well. And we have to kind of figure out where it goes from here. Um, we've already put some significant investments into it, uh, myself and the other board members. We've already acquired a lot of materials and stuff that we need for it. Um, we're in the process of incorporating, setting up some nonprofit. We're talking to people about um, uh, being able to have a permanent space and maybe as, maybe finding some government funding that can help support that. It's a lot, and it's occupied a lot of my mind space. It's uh, yeah, it's something that art wise it's great what I'm, what I'm really trying to do more than anything is not say no to an opportunity right it seems like a roundabout way to support my art but I do believe that it does I believe that it's great experience for myself certainly is great on my resume that I've not sat at home and done nothing over the course I am I'm working whether I'm getting paid for it or not at the moment it's really about what we're trying to create, how it can benefit the community, and, you know, in a sense, benefit myself and the other board members. So that has, you know, it's been a ton of work managing it, managing my art, my podcast, editing the video version, working on commissions. We're going to do a motivation uh, podcast topic, I think, here soon. Um, but I wanted to touch on one point. Everybody is different, but when I get overwhelmed... I feel like there's so much to do I can shut down, I can lock up. It's so daunting to try to uh, get everything done. Uh, the whole where do I start mentality, I joke with my daughters um, because she's, she's doing a lot of creative projects. Uh, one, well both of them, one is doing um, character creation, another one's doing animation, another one is creating it like a mascot fursuit for herself, like building it from the ground up. It's crazy, but it's daunting. Just like what I'm doing right now is daunting. It seems so overwhelming. Where do I even start? And the joke, what I always tell her is, you know, the old joke, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You got to start somewhere. So while we're going to dig into motivation in another episode, that's really what that's really what I'm trying to do. Take a breath, go for a walk. I'm far from a guru guru when it comes to getting things done, but I'm getting better. Main thing I've learned is that it's not motivation that leads to actions. It's actions that lead to motivation. It's kind of a weird roundabout thing. People think that they've got to wait for this moment of motivation to kind of inspire them. Now I'm going to do something. It doesn't work that way. It comes down to routine. You think about... How do you get stuff done at your regular job, your old job? And I'm trying to apply that here. So my old job would be my alarm is set at a certain time. I have to get up. I've got to jump in the shower. I've got to drive to the office. I've got stuff that I have to do as soon as I get in in the morning, stuff that I have to do next. And it's very much the same thing here. If I sleep late, roll out of bed, don't shower, vaguely kind of putter on the computer while TV's running in the background, I'll get nothing done. There's no question that's the way it's going to be. So I am treating stuff with the market and treating stuff with my art very much like it is a job. So I was up early this morning, I jumped in the shower, brought my computer and everything downstairs, so I'm removed from all the distractions that are upstairs. I've been struggling with my with the pod because I had the video all done from last week's episode and was bound and determined I wanted the video version done before I put up the next one which pushed everything back and ended up being late this week which I will not allow to happen again because that's a frustrating thing for me not being able to deliver even if they are just um, 
limitations and restrictions I've put on myself, I'm still worth meeting those deadlines. So I, I, I will be making a point kind of going forward. Now that I've got, I've got the right software, I've found some open source stuff, I've found the things that I need. Um, but just pick something and do it. You know, even if it's starting the day by making your bed and jumping in the shower, you've done something, right? Uh, if it's going for a walk with a dog, you've done something. You know, um, which is where, you know, waiting for everything to render and getting everything done. And to, even this morning, I was getting all the, the video version is up on YouTube for last week's episode. Awesome. And while I was waiting for it to render, I sat there and typed out the script for today. Um, and I do write a loose script. I, I try to stay on point. I can absolutely <laughs> tend to ramble. And I bring it up on screen as a reference as I go through it. Some things I have typed out really clearly. Some things are just points um, that I can jump into. You know, things that you notice as you're working on it. You know, I notice the, and I listen to the, to the old podcast from the week before. You know, what what sounds good, what didn't work. Do I have to turn this up, turn this down? Um, like the the version that I record on, on Anchor, right on my iPhone, which is how I do all the audio for the podcast, is great. Um, but I noticed that the version where I use my big mic, get that in on the camera, it got, it was loud, it was picking up much more, so I had to turn down the gain. Just to get it, just to get it balanced out, so it sounded good. Um, and again, I even have my ums and ahs, which I'm still doing. <laughs> Some on little markers um, uh, to remind myself, like, dude, you're saying it so much. Just pause for a second. All in the effort to try to make the pod better, make it a value for you guys, and make it a value for me, and something that's fun. Um, you know. Just remember that I'm never going to get rid of those entirely. I'll try to improve. Um, so I'm setting goals for the pod. I'm setting goals for myself. I'll keep you up to date to how I'm doing. Um, that's the whole point. We're not perfect creatures, but we can constantly work to improve. And that's what I'm doing. Remember, you're not only working on your work, you're working on yourself. You know, with your work, you're working on the quality of your work and working on your body of your work. We'll talk about that and kind of how we can improve both of those in, in other pods. But don't forget about yourself. Burnout is such a real thing, and it can horribly affect your work. And I know that I am on the brink of it this week, and hence the delays, and, and those are things I don't want to have going forward. Try to make a point of what are your important things in your art world write them down and make sure that you get at least some of the small ones every day and get into that routine and then start adding the others and take another bite out of that elephant okay for those who wanted to jump ahead let's get into the main topic of the day how do i price my work first and foremost i want to say there's no wrong way to price your work there's no hard rules Anybody who tells you you have to do it this way is talking out of their hat. There, there are lots of people who can provide insight. I don't believe anyone, whether they've been selling forever or on a gallery or whatever, is the perfect person to answer. Having said that, we can definitely share some guidelines that I've found that'll help you really dial in the best price you can get for your work. First and foremost to me, sorry, a little coffee for those who are listening and not seeing, is understanding your market. What will your local area bear? You're probably not going to be selling to the whole world right out of the gate. You're probably big. I'm, so I'm thinking about where do you live? So let's make the comparison. I live in, uh, well, outside of Fredericton, New Brunswick. Fredericton, New Brunswick is probably around 50,000 people with surrounding area we get around 70,000 people compare that to my hometown Sussex which is like 7,000 people compare that to, to Toronto which I don't even know the exact population I'm quite sure it's over a million 
So when you look at each of those markets, you have to think about how many buyers you have out there. You know, what's the range that art can sell for? Who are your competition in those markets, right? A small town could be interesting. You're going to have fewer buyers. Generally, your price is probably going to be lower out of the gate. Um, uh, making that same analogy, a piece of my artwork here in Fredericton, if I'm just selling to the local market, if I am, let's say if it's, um, it's a small piece, it's 100 bucks that I'm selling it for. Maybe for the same piece, I can only get 80 for it in Sussex, but maybe I could sell it for 200 in Toronto. Just as an example, because you have a bigger market, more potential buyers, more people that can see your work, you want to try to build, you want to keep that in mind. The first thing you want to think about out of the gate is your market. Um, so what you can do in the way, uh, we'll go back to, let's see, I'm talking about market, but I want to talk about the outlooks first. We'll, we'll dive into the market, market in a second. I've seen two common outlooks from my artist peers when it comes to where they start with their pricing. They're either one, timid, as many artists are. They start small. Probably they're undervaluing their work, taking whatever they can get um, versus the other side, which is confident and you might look at it as headstrong. I, I don't know if that's right, but they believe in their max value out of their gate and they hold it. So, and I'll use that example because I've seen people that, here's the thing, perception is everything. So, if you've got confidence and max value out of the gate, which my mentor, I have a, I have a painter in the city who I'm incredibly fond of and has been very helpful to me along the way. Uh, if, you if you don't know, Angel Terry is in Frederick, New Brunswick. Check out his work. It's incredible. Um, he doesn't self-promote nearly as much as he needs to, but he had the confidence out of the gate that, you know, he said, this is the amount of my work. This is, this is the size, of, for this size of piece, this is what I charge. And held it from the get-go, that's my price. And he said, you know, first four months, six months, maybe close to a year, hardly sold anything, you know, barely anything at all. But when people sold, they perceived a value in his work. His work is, is worth X. So that's, you know, he, his, art is, his art is worth this much, right? Because people really kind of, perception is everything. If you tell them that's what it's worth, that's what it's worth versus starting really low, maybe too low, then people might look at your artwork as, for lack of a better term, like yard sale-y. Right? Oh, it's just, oh, it's a little this, you know. And that's not talking about skill set. That's not talking about the results of the work. That's not talking about your effort. That's just your own perception and what you've put on to people. And those are the two most common things that I see. And, and again, neither is right nor wrong. It's just the path of how you get to, you know, how you're going to then price your work. So what, what did I do? What I did was I had no idea where to start, as most of you probably do. So I went out and went to a local restaurant that had an art auction. They had literally dozens of artists with work up. I walked through the entire auction with a little notepad and a pen. I think actually I could look online. They had all the paintings up with prices online and the sizes. So I made a grid. And I'm like, okay, here's a good sampling of artists in my city. Some more established, some very much new. And what are they charging? And I figured out what they're charging for their work and then found an average and then set myself a little below average. 
to start? I'm like, because nobody knows who I am. What's my starting point? Where do I even begin? And then I set my price and built up from there. So I kind of told the market out of the gate that, hey, I'm new. Uh, I'm new, so my prices are a little bit lower than a lot of the artists you've seen in the area. And then as people bought my work, my prices went up. And now I'm probably above average, certainly not at the top of what I see in my city. But you, you are again setting the standard for your pieces. You're always going to have somebody go, oh my God, you're charging that much? Why would I pay that? And in the same breath, you're gonna have somebody else come by maybe five minutes later and go, wow, your prices are really good. So you can't let, you know, any one person set your pricing. You can't, you have to really kind of think about where you fit in the market space, um, how you want to be perceived, and how much time do you have? Like, do you want to get start selling today? Then you need to think about where we talked about last episode, what do I sell, where do I sell, getting into different price point things with your art, having smaller pieces, you know, whether they're replica, like if you do a big statue, maybe you can get smaller resin replicas made. If it's, you know, paintings, then, you know, maybe you do some small little one-offs that don't take you very much time to do. Maybe you do prints. I do prints, I make magnets. But having small impulse buys, having love, hey, that's not a bad price, hadn't planned on spending it, but yeah, I love that, I'm going to buy it. And aspirational things, things that, man, that, that costs a lot, but I'd really love to have it. And they think about it a lot and save, and it becomes like a discussion point in their brain. You want to have multiple levels that you can sell at. So you want to think about that with your pricing. If you want to sell right away, you need those things right out of the gate. If you are not in any kind of urgent rush, you can certainly take the strong, confident route, look at those prices like I did. Hey, these are the people that are at the top. I think my quality is of similar level. That's what I'm selling at. One thing I will say, no matter what approach you take, I recommend generally not backing off prices. This is one of the issues I have with, there's an auction that I attend regularly. They're wonderful people. I love the auction. The challenge is I'll put in a big piece that is priced by my pricing accordingly. Uh, so it may have a large price point because I do big pieces a lot and, and my the auctions generally want my big pieces. The challenge with the uh, auctions is, and I've talked to buyers, that's another great thing you should always do. You should always talk to buyers and find out how they buy, how they're, what about art excites them. And what I was told is they go to the auctions, they buy the smaller pieces, generally at full price, because you have to pay full price to get them, otherwise you're bidding, and they bid on the big and hope the bid doesn't go too high because they know they're getting a great piece of art at a low price point. And another artist that I know, who I, I respect, told me flat out they stopped putting pieces in the auction because they're like, if my piece costs $1,600, but they get it at the auction for $900, well, my piece that size isn't worth $1,600. It's only worth $900 because they got it for nine. So people, rather than paying you what your art is worth, they'll pay for what they can get it at. And it kind of, in a way, sets the value of your work. And because of that, I've actually had pieces in the auction that I've bought back rather than let them go at that price point. I know not everybody can afford to do that, but that's something that I keep pricing in mind a lot when I'm thinking about what is my work worth, what do I want to charge. It's important, you know, kind of figuring out, because again, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to say it again. In your local art market and online as you build it up and you get bigger, perception is everything. People believe the message that you tell them, your other buyers tell them, the impression they get out of what you do is, is, is everything. So, so you've got a good handle on your market. 
then how do I find my starting price for anything? There's a couple of methods for calculating price for artwork. I'm going to talk a lot about paintings and drawings because it's what I do the most. You can apply this to any crafts you're doing, any, any creative projects, be it sculpture, be it whatever. These are a couple ways you can do it, and I'll tell you how I found my starting price. So you can calculate with time and materials. So when I say time and materials, take all the materials, all the costs of whatever it was to make what you made. Then how much time do you, did you put into it? So let's say I want to make $60,000 a year with my artwork. Let's pull that out of the air because it's probably close to what I'd like to do. I'd like to pay all my bills and make a decent living as an artist. If I want to make $60,000 a year, if I was working a regular 9 to 5 job, this is a good little math thing you can do in your head, you need to be making about, if you want to make $60,000 a year, you've got to be making about $30 an hour. If you want to make $50,000 a year, you've got to be making about $25 an hour. If you want $100,000 a year, you need to be making about $50 an hour. So I apply that, you can apply that math to your cost. So if I need to make, if, if my cost of my materials is, it's probably low if it's painting, let's say maybe $5 because it's a small canvas. Um, and I, yeah, let's say it's, let's say it's a small, small canvas around five bucks and it takes me an hour to do the painting. Then I'm starting out at a price of 35 bucks if that's how you want to do it. If I'm making more per hour, then I apply more per price. The challenge can be different pieces of artwork you make might take more time. So I set mine to the max. I think about if I'm doing a impasto painting. So impasto is when you take thick paint and you kind of put it on with a palette knife. and It's much more impressionistic. That would be the fastest painting I could do. I find they're really quick. I love doing them. I love the tech. I love texture. So they're fun. Now, the one that's the most time intensive would be a portrait. So if I'm doing a, por I do a lot of portraits for people. You can see some from the background and stuff. Some floating by on the screen. They take the most time because it's all about getting a likeness. If you don't have the likeness of the person you're painting, the commission's done. Nobody's going to want it. So I price my pieces based on what's going to take the longest. And then if it takes less time, that's great. So I'm using, in a sense, time and materials. But you want to be able to easily get that across to the customer. And the way I do that is by cost per square inch. Since I'm always dealing, or you could do square centimeter. Or if you're working with sculptures, you could go by height. You know, I don't know if you do weight. But you can kind of figure out giving the customer a unit that they can easily calculate. You can also say, I only work in these sizes. These are the sizes I do, right? And these are the prices for each one. You can set flat pricing if you want like that. There's nothing wrong. Again, there are no rules, guys. None of these are wrong. You can choose the way you want to go. I try to make it as simple as I can for the customer because I want to be able to make as big as I want to make, and I set a minimum size. Like I don't do anything smaller than 12 inches. I will, but I will charge you as much as I do for a 12 inch, because the time is probably going to be about the same. If I do an 8 by 8, it's probably going to be very similar to, I won't do commissions smaller than 12. That's a better way to put it. I will do little one-offs that I'll sell at the market that take me maybe a half hour for some cute little thing, and then I'll throw a $20 price point on it because it didn't take me much time. Right? And it didn't take a lot of materials. So I'm creating those little impulse buy things. right? But by figuring out, OK, if I'm going to do a 12 by 12 portrait, the most amount of time I'm going to spend on it's four hours for something 12 inches by 12 inches. That's a poor, you know something else I might be able to do in an hour or less. Landscape, maybe an hour. But a portrait's going to be four. So if I want $30 an hour, 30 times four, 120. Right? And lo and behold, my current pricing for 12 by 12 is 120. So I do the math backwards, and I started at a price per square inch, 144 square inches. It works out to 85 cents a square inch, which is what I currently charge. But I've been painting for a while. I've, I've been drawing most of my life. I've been painting for almost two and a half years. 
I didn't start at 85 cents a square inch. I started at 35 cents a square inch because I did the math at all the artwork that was at that auction and the average price was 50 cents a square inch. You know, across, there must have been almost 50 artists. Once I did the math and gridded it all out and figured out what other people were charging, I'm like, okay, the average artist is charging 50 cents a square inch. Let's start at 35 because I'm nobody. Who the heck am I? And just started posting every day. Putting up, I, I gave myself the challenge of 100 paintings in 100 days. I love painting. It was something I wanted to do. But sharing your work all the time, something I haven't done as of late because I've been so overwhelmed. But we'll get back in, right? We adjust and then we regroup to where we need to be. But I started at 35 cents a square inch and it wasn't long in that I started getting, uh, you know, about 20 paintings in after sharing a piece of art every day. This is before the market or anything. I started getting commissions. So originally, you know, at 35 cents a square inch, that meant that, you know, they were paying maybe 50 bucks for a 12 by 12, 50, 60 dollars, hardly anything at all. But it was, uh, and again, it was probably, it wasn't anywhere near my price where I wanted to be, but it gave me a starting point. And to give you kind of a, a scale of reference, I do know that galleries typically, and galleries are a whole other topic for another day. Galleries are dying, kids. You're only going to see provincial or statewide galleries here in probably the next 10 years or so. There are so many other ways to sell your artwork. Get out there and do them all. And we're going to talk about that as well in another podcast. But a gallery typically, as a rule of thumb, they're going to take 40, 50% of whatever they want to sell. So they aren't even going to talk to you until you come in at over two, three dollars a square inch. Some don't even talk to you till you're five dollars a square inch. I'm at 85 cents. I, I, my paintings sell for a decent price, right? But I'm nowhere near the level a gallery would typically even consider me. But I'm actively making a living with my artwork. So what I did is I started at 35. I went up fairly quickly to 50. Stayed there for quite a while. Then I went up to 70 cents a square inch. Then 85. And actually, I'm really considering soon going to a dollar. Uh, it, it makes sense with my time. The main thing I don't do is you kind of gauge the market. As long as you have demand and as long as your work's selling, consider every three to six months going up. As long as you're constantly creating, as long as you're selling your work, think about going up and seeing what the market will bear. If you see a dramatic stop or slowdown in your sales, hold your price until you pick back up to the level you're at. The last thing you want to do is say, okay, my price is this now, and then, oh, no, no, you're not buying, it's back here again, sorry. Your perception is everything. You are telling people what you're worth. And if you back off and go back down to a lower price point, you're telling them, well, I'm really only worth that much. Have confidence in what you have. Go up slowly. Like I've, and maybe it's still because I'm at a low price point, you know, relatively, you know, at 85 cents, uh, it means that I, on occasion, get people who will look at a piece and go, whoa, that's a lot. But the majority of the time, when I have people asking for commissions and I tell them my price, okay, good. I don't get, I don't get any kind of pushback. They came to me because they like my work. They would like to get a piece of my work. And the most they ever might do is maybe change the size. 85 cents a square inch. I was going to get an 18 by 24, but that's a little bit more than I want to pay. Let's go down to a 16 by 20. And that's fine. They're still getting the piece of work they want of yours. You are still following your pricing rules that you've kind of set for yourself. And it gives you, it gives you a, a, a firm structure to grow. And it allows me, in my case, that if I'm talking about, I have a set price per square inch for drawings. I have a set uh, price for digital work because to me, I'm not using any materials there. It's just my time. And I can change the resolution, so it doesn't really matter the size, so I have a flat fee for digital work. But if I'm doing painting, you know, that whether I'm doing a 12 inch by 12 inch or the, what I'm working on right now, which is 48 inches by 48 inches, it's massive, it's 85 cents a square inch. I charge across the board, and it's an easy way 
even if you get into weird sizes, somebody wants like, they've got a big, long, wide mantle and they want a narrow painting that's really wide. You can get custom stuff made. Because you have a formula, you can apply it, right? This is what I charge per square inch. You do the math, this is gonna be your final fee and you can easily do it out. So that's, that's why I like that format. You can certainly use any of the other ones that make sense to you, but you do need a structure in your pricing. Make it easier for your clientele. If you only want to say, I only do these five sizes of sculptures, or I'm doing pottery and I do, you know, little cups and bigger bowls and I do vases and I price each of those size things under the same cross board. Any of my mugs, it's the same thing right? You can do that in any kind of format. Like I said, there's no right or wrong, but building out a structure for your pricing and keep in mind as you create more, you develop, your work is worth more, and you need to charge accordingly. So last episode, we talked about what to sell. Today, we talked about pricing, which means next time we're going to talk about how do you make a living off all this? And it kind of tied to what I'm working on right now, every day. Uh, and I'll share the steps I've put in so far. And I'm, I'll be the first one to say, I'm not there yet, 100%. But I believe I will be. And I believe you can too. So thanks so much for listening, guys. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered, you can click the message link in the Anchor podcast. You can... Um, I want to make sure I get my ums and ahs. I, that's why I've got these notes here. So you can click the message link in the Anchor podcast on the main page. You can send us an email at flyingbytheseatofmypaints at gmail.com. Yes, I know it's a ridiculously long email. Hey, yes, I'm keeping it because I like it. So flyingbytheseatofmypaints at gmail.com. If you think you have some good, uh, we have some good advice in the pod, please take a moment to subscribe. Rate us on your platform of your choice. That'll help us get shared so more people can find us. And hey, Maybe recommend this to another fellow artist who's thinking about taking the same leap that we're doing. Until next time, this is Jim Middleton. Just keep creating.